folks, Just Face Sabora here. Since we're already in October, which is Halloween month, I'm going to be reviewing my first horror related film that just came out that summer on June 24th of this year. It's called The Black Phone. It's based on a short story by Joe Hill, which follows a young 13 year old boy who just been abducted by a serial killer who's been abducting children around, mostly boys, who's wearing a creepy demonic mask you know, for a disguise known as the Grabber. And he sends the boy straight into a soundproof basement. And on the wall, there's a black Wadari dial phone where he begins to hear something mysterious under the receiver. And he does whatever he takes to survive and escape. It stars Ethan Hawke, as you may know from a lot of great movies such as Explorers, Dead Poet Society, Alive, uh, the before movies that we have, which he teams up with Julie Duffy. Uh, Mason Thames, Madeline McGraw, Jeremy Davies from Saber Pride and Ryan. Uh, he was also in Spanking the Monkey, as well as uh, Dogville and Helter Skelter from 2004 when he played Charles Manson. Uh, e. Roger Mitchell, who was in the TV series The Shield and One Tree Hill. But he's been in other works too, including The Hunger Games, Catching Fire. Troy uh, Wadaseel, James uh, Ransone, Miguel Casare Mora, Rebecca Clark, J. Gavin Wild, Spencer Fitzgerald, Jordan Isaiah White, Bradley Ryan. Um, Tristan Provon, Jacob Moran, Brady Hepner, and Banks uh, Repetta. It's written by Scott Derrickson, who's best known for giving us um, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. He also did uh, the first Doctor Strange, which came out in 2016. And he also did Sinister which also stars uh, Ethan Hawke. Uh, the Day the Earth Stood Still remake with Keanu Reeves. Not a very good one. And he also did Deliver Us from Evil. Um, he's joined by C. Robert um, Cargill and is directed once again by Scott Derrickson. Might be a little bit of spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie, then I suggest you should check it out before you see my review. Keep that in mind. Anyway, the movie began set in a suburban town of Denver, Colorado in 1978, where we meet this demonic mask serial killer who's a child abductor known as the Grabber, who's played by Ethan Hawke, prowls around the streets, kidnapping all these kids, particularly younger boys and teenage boys as they disappeared without a trace. Meanwhile, we meet the Blake family with the siblings, brother and sister, named Finley, who's a young 13-year-old teenager, and his younger sister, Gwen, they're both played by Mason Thames and Madeline McGraw. Yeah. Finney basically just hangs out with his friends, uh, plays baseball and all, but he has been bullied a lot. While Gwen, uh, well, going to his same school, and she's a very tough fighter. I mean, she can really uh, beat the crap out of those bullies more than he does. 
she's experiencing some psychic dreams about what's happening recently and all especially dreaming about all the kidnapping that's happening uh, she has this gift coming from her mom who passed away uh, they're both very religious so she does trust uh, Jesus what he believes because she does read the the Psalms uh, Bible and all anyway she begins to get a call from the detectives uh, Ryden Miller both played by E. Roger Mitchell and Troy with um, which they had to interview her at school uh, with the principal believing that she has the inside knowledge to begin to find all the clues and all but they struggle to believe her claim because their father who's an alcoholic widower and abuser named Terrence uh, played by Jeremy Davis um, didn't want to deal with all this um, stress and tra uh, traumatic uh, moments that's happening so at that rate, um, their father ends up uh, punishing Gwen for speaking with the detectives, you know, um, whipping her completely, and and her brother Finley had spotted her. So shortly after, the grabber abducted Robin. That's uh, Finney's uh, best friend. Yeah, he wanted to take him to go see like an R-rated film, but he's not allowed. And I know they were talking about, you know, if, if you've seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or or maybe go see like, you know, like a, a kung fu movie like Bruce Lee with Enter the Dragon, that sort of thing. So yeah, they also abducted his. Um, other friend uh, when he was playing baseball so all of them had been missing but days later Finney had encountered the grabber which the grabber however is dressed up like a, a party supply man you know just you know, wearing a costume kind of like a clown but he has a top hat he's wearing the mask and he grabs those uh, black balloons and all like he was just gonna go door to door to celebrate everyone's birthday or any other party but then he eventually kidnaps um, Finney and took him directly into the soundproof basements he's all alone it has a bed it has a toilet seat and it has all these air vents around but the wall has all these uh, cracks here and there but the only thing that they have aside from being partially empty was there's a a black Atari uh, phone that's disconnected it wasn't working um, as the grabber claims while wearing the mask and he wears like different kinds of masks of any choice. I mean, some of them are pretty scald, like double like, and all. Sometimes you can see his forehead with his eyes. Other times you just see, like maybe, partially his mouth, and then it just keeps changing here and there. I mean, sometimes he's all alone. He guards um, next in the kitchen, you know, next to the refrigerator and all. We also learned that he has a brother uh, in the next room. Uh, his name is Max, uh, played by James uh, Rassone. And he's very eccentric. I mean, granted, he he does uh, snort some coke, and he, he goes around you know, going completely nuts. You know, like, he, like he's already tracking every single boy in town. Like you thought maybe he would know about all the abductions that's been happening recently and he was trying to figure out what's what street is uh, they're gonna go next but in reality this was their target that they're about to choose 
Yes. The police search had been pretty unsuccessful trying to search for Finney because um, Gwen has been having some more psychic dreams, hoping that this would lead to, to him as opposed to all the other boys around. Um, therefore, the grabber had brought uh, Finney some food, which is scrambled eggs and a bottle of Sprite, and leaves the door so that way he'll be able to have some. But then, next thing you know, he begins to hear the phone ring, considering that it was all disconnected and all. And it turns out that on the receiver, he begins to experience um, someone on the phone. And it turns out to be all the boys that have been kidnapped and abducted. And, and at this rate, they've been murdered, as we learn. And this is a big shocker, too, because actually, they were ghosts. Yes, so now they get to... He be, so now Finney gets to hear their voice directly to them, and then you begin to see them all invisible. They're they're beginning to, to trace all the steps that's going around and hoping they're going to help him try his best to escape from this uh, basement room. Try to give him all the instructions he need. Um, you notice that there's a scene where uh, the bottle spins. So now we know that they're there. It's going to take a lot of miracle for him to try to get out of it. But every time he tries to do so, he often gets caught or the fact that he gets stuck. Like he had, he found like a hole uh, right into the tile. He tries to dig right deeper. Uh, next thing you know, he tries to, to get, to go straight up to the, uh, the window that's on top which um, had been blocked so hoping he might be able to find a way to escape easily and then next thing you know um, he begins to get a combination number that's written inside the wall so he'll be able to memorize it once he tries to uh, get straight into out of the basement into the kitchen and go straight to the front door where it's been locked and has the combination lock so he'll be able to remember and buy. And he's doing his best to escape, but then we hear the dog barking. And when he did that, he got caught by the grabber. Uh, and then he was sent back to the basement until finally he gets a call from Robin. He also gets a call from all the other bullies around, which... Gwen actually had spotted at a local convenience store, yeah, where he was about to get arrested after committing a, a, a huge fight against um, all of his friends. Uh, it was a very brutal fight. I mean, just like how he started having all these brutal, he started giving all these brutal fights to all the other bullies, and all the other bullies around too started brutally uh, attack uh, him and, and everyone else and all. Of course, Robin is is the one who also stands up against those assholes, and just he also beats them up completely in that one scene. Uh, anyway, so of course, all the other guys, you know, they're they're doing his best to help. So when he finally uh, got in touch with with Robin, he tell them to actually practice by taking the phone and just whacking him completely and even use even choke him with the receiver and all and and all all of that around so hope this will be his preparement to finally escape for sure uh, just as soon as the detectives arrive along with the police department and Gwen because Gwen had finally spotted where the house is at by the by the numbers and everything that, that went around. So, I gotta say, man, they were very smart. So, finally, 
he got even with the the grabber you know he stopped them he he killed them completely he trapped them too um while well, he brought in the dog the grabber already killed his brother max by stabbing him with the axe on his head just when he came downstairs to the basement because now he begins to find out uh, what just really happened the truth so now uh, the grabber got what he deserved and he finally escaped until he found his sister Gwen around that was across the street it turns out that actually the bodies were found from the across the street from the other house so now we know that there's actually two houses where he buries um, all the victims um, inside uh, the other basement so across the street is exactly where he got kidnapped all alone in, in this sound booth so I find this amazing that they had two houses so the search was over um, they finally caught um, the grabber and Max too. I well, yeah, because they're both dead. Um, they they also caught out with the bodies of all the other victims too. So, <sighs> what a relief! So now he's he's finally back at school and now has a lab partner and well, <laughs> things are going back to normal now. So there you go. <laughs> what a surprise uh, this is actually the best uh, horror film to come out this year I mean I know there have been other movies that just came out recently but so far so good I, I really admire this one because I'm glad to hear that at least there's a movie that actually has more intelligence and smart and you actually got kids at that age who are or not annoying like you really care for them yes they curse but still they really knew what they're doing and they're trying to do what they can to to get out of it from all this this craziness uh, coming from these serial killers I mean it's sad that that all the boys you know got killed by this um, this crazy man but nevertheless, I mean, at least we got one boy who can survive and escape. And I know he did everything he could to do so. I mean, especially when he tries to to grab the, the toilet seat, uh, took the top and and tried to dig right through the the wall that's been blocked into the freezer, you know, where where they held all, all the stakes around. Uh, that was troublesome and then there's other scenes around which I, I know he did sort of drink some toilet water on the side I mean disgusting I know but what what can you do he's all alone he's trying to get out of it and and the way they barricaded the the walls are damn it, it, that's scary I mean, especially if you have to make it soundproof and all, and, and it has all these cracked lines and all. It looked like almost like blood around, and then it has all these secrets. Because now we know that all these kids have been in there, in that particular room, before they get ready for it. Yeah. Um, boy, and it's scary when you think about it. And the fact that you had to see all these ghosts of, of these victims is just incredible. Okay. There's scenes where, yes, you, you can see all the scars going around uh, on their faces, or even there's one scene where you have one boy that's, or, um, I mean, at first I thought it was a girl, but it was actually a boy, who's uh, doing his bend pose, uh, very flexible pose right there, but he was killed and all, but it's amazing that, you know, even when they're dead, they can... They can still help them out. I mean, this is almost sort of in the... Kind of like uh, the movie The Sixth Sense in a way. You know, The Sixth Sense, where you actually have uh, one boy, a gifted boy. I mean, there's even times when he wears glasses without the lens. And and he does, you know, make contact with the dead, a ghost around. I mean, it's, 
it's, it's scary, but it's a perfect gift to, to understand all the secrets that's behind all that. And that's very true, uh, unique writing and a lot of amazing, um, horrific uh, scenes here and there that they put into it. And that, that's how you do a, a true intelligent horror movie right there. Even Hawk's performance is just very frightening, by the way. I mean, there are times when you couldn't even recognize that's, that's him underneath it all. But if he had to take off his mask, you'll be able to see him in his normal self. But with the mask on, I mean, he's just creepy. Like, he's very scary. I mean, you, you want to get away from him psychologically right there. So, wow. I mean, this is terrific. I mean, he's an excellent actor, and he can really pull this off. Um, but the actor who played uh, Finney in the role, who's the lead of the story, um, is terrific also. I mean, he, you know, this is exactly why we need very smart child actors who can really pull it off and not not be, you know, terrible and all, and not be annoying or anything like that. He was a very tough kid. He really tries to figure out everything. Yeah, he did cry, but that's because he has trouble trying to get out. He's struggling so hard, but he's going to fight it against these uh, bad guys. And and his sister, um, Madeline McGraw, who played her, is just exhilarating as well I mean she's she's very tough I mean she, the scene where he she stood up against those bullies was, was just incredible even though yeah he she got beat up and went right next to that one guy who just which he she actually took took care of that man right away and it was just wow even though he got beat up completely but his friend Robin, who's played by Miguel Mazzari Mora, you know, he was very strong. Hex, he beat the shit out of that one bully completely. And there was one time when they were in the bathroom and he was trying to talk him out of it before these guys leave. So now they can finally be together to find out some plans and all. There are a lot of visual uh, scenes in the film, like it gives it a bit of a uh, a 16 millimeter shot of that filled with film grain around when they get into the, the visions of Gwen's um, psychic dreams. Like I'm, I'm surprised her own vision is all shot this way, you know, just to give it a classic feel. And it does give it a 70s feel completely because they got all the details right. Like, you don't spot any errors whatsoever, so that's refreshing. And um, all these slashings that we see, I mean, nothing much. There is some blood, mostly from the scenes getting, you know, beat up brutally by bullies and all, and, and someone stands up against them, too. And I also learned that the mask was created by none other than Tom Savini. Yeah, the legendary special effects actor and director who's regularly in those uh, Robert Regas movies. Um, but he actually ma managed to make this mask uh, very demonically creepy and scary. Very menacing for, for Hulk, especially when he tries to do that performance right there. It almost gives it a bit of a, a sad, but almost... Uh, distance right here like there are times when you can't even recognize him until you'll see him right at the very end wow very impressive how they did it jump scares are memorable luckily there was only two but nothing much so you can still turn it up to make sure you begin to hear the dialogue but but at least it's not they're not overdoing it thank goodness in a movie like this you don't really need any of that at all that's for sure um, so this is exactly why all filmmakers nowadays really need to start making horror movies just right anyway 
But since it's based on the short story by Joe Hill, uh, they're thinking about doing a possible sequel, so that would be nice. Um, it's nice to hear that Jason Blum produced this because, you know, lately he's been producing all the same old garbage like he's often do. I mean, at, at first I thought this was going to be yet another Purge movie because of the mask. Thank God it wasn't. I mean, I know Ethan Hawke was in the first Purge film, but that was trash. I don't know what's so great about these that movie, you know, about a purge that's happening in the city, you know, where they go around and you know, home invading all these these neighbors and and victims all around, all innocent. It's just disgusting. And they're doing what they can to survive. All these home invading movies are just too much. You know, home invasion. Um, and it's a big hit so far. Uh, just made 161 million dollars um, out of its 18 million budget. That's a great deal. Uh, it's already on Blu-ray now, um, and on streaming available. Uh, I think it's on 4K. Yeah, I think it is. It should be. Uh, with the digital code and all. So um, maybe I'll pick this up someday too if I get a chance. Uh, for a lot less, because I really enjoyed it. Um, Scott Derrickson did an excellent job directing this film, uh, because he does a great job with other films he's done, I mean, good or bad, but he's very talented. I mean, he had to do this one after, um, after he couldn't do the sequel to Doctor Strange, uh, which they gave it to Sam Raimi. And they filmed this movie at North Carolina, uh, at Wilmington, North Carolina uh, Studios, which is the, which used to be um, the North Carolina F uh, Film Corporation, which was, which then became DG Studios, and then K and Kuroko Studio, and and then now it's uh, E E U E, yeah E U E uh, Screen Gems. Uh, that's where they shot uh, Dawson's Creek, the series. So that's a perfect location. I, I knew I, I knew some of the streets looked familiar too because they would have been shown in the movie Maximum Overdrive. It didn't look like uh, Denver, Colorado, in a way. So I knew I recognized uh, some of the the streets and the houses around. So perfect. Um. So. Check out this movie if you must. Um, this is one of the better horror films to come out this year, by far. And it's worth watching more than once, for sure. And we need more movies like this. <laughs> we sure do. So anyway, that's The Black Phone, and I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.